Hey guys, uh, so welcome back. Now we're going to work on phase three. Um, now this is my favorite phase of it because it's the most interesting to me on the operation. And it's pretty cool when you start seeing new things that you haven't really encountered before. So this is me in phase three. I've done a lot of uh, configurations and I've always done phase two. And for the longest time I just didn't understand what phase three is and how it operates. But you know, now that I got the grasp on it, I figure I'll show you guys. So we'll start by doing the same thing. We're going to shut down all the tunnel interfaces. Shut down interface tunnel 100. We're going to shut that down as well. And then config T. Hold up. Interface tunnel 100. We're going to shut that down as well. So we got all our tunnel interfaces shut down. Now, what we're going to do to configure phase three, it actually is only two commands. Um, well, a few commands. I, let me, um, I'm going to clear out this, uh, the summary address that I have for, uh, EIGRP because it has the leak map attached, uh, leak map, leak map attached to it. And I don't want that, um, that, uh, that result. So I shall run, do show run, tunnel 100, just make sure that's all the way gone. Okay, perfect. All right, so on the hub, there's a few things that we got to do. Two two commands that we really need to add. So remember DMVPN phase two, it, did, it didn't allow you to be able to use a, um, a summary address the way we normally would use a default route without having a leak map, which is the workaround, right? Now, with phase three, it allows you to do that without having to worry about leaking specific routes because NHRP will actually install a host route and the destination route in the routing table for you. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. So one of the commands that we're going to do, need is the IP NHRP, uh, NHRP redirect command. And that's the command that is used uh, when, uh, when the uh, router of the hub receives that registration request for that network residing in the other spoke. It knows, then it will then redirect the actual message to the spoke, letting that spoke know, hey, send that request to this guy. And that's that whole interaction ends up going on. So that command, and then also the IP summing address, EIGRP 100, and then 0 .0 .0 .0 All right, beautiful. Now, the command that we need to do on the spokes, it's actually gonna be one command. It's gonna be IP NHRP shortcut. Now what that does is it tells the router to bypass any other entries or bypass the default route and use the actual NHRP shortcut entry that was made when the dynamic spoke to spoke tunnel was created. Um, and I'll show you that output in a second. So we got that on router five, uh, three, IP NHRP shortcut. Beautiful. So we're gonna bring up our tunnels, no shut. No shut, and no shut. And take a little second for everything to come back in. Remember, like I said, everything was still, uh, we got EIGRP up already, and waiting for five to correspond. But the these are still multi-point GRE tunnels in the hub and the spoke, and perfect. So we got EIGRP up on both devices. So, inspecting the routing table here. Show IP route. Router 3. You'll notice, show IP route EIGRP. So we don't look at the actual. So we only have one route coming from EIGRP, which is the default route that route we got from router 1, which is the hub. Um, same thing on uh, router 5. Show IP route EIGRP. Same deal. Uh, only that one static, that one default route that we got from the EIGRP process. No leak maps in this, right? So, same thing we want to do the spoke to spoke communication. How do we do that? Well, because we have phase three enabled, now if I send a ping to router three's, uh, from router three to router five, either that 555 uh, uh, loopback or the 055 loopback, um, I should be able to use the spoke to spoke tunnel to do both communications. Let's double check. 
So we do a trace route. 155.5.5.5 source loopback 3 or loopback 0. And what happens? Initially, we go through the hub. But then, now, we have the spoke-to-spoke uh, -spoke communication. Now, how did that happen if we don't actually have a route to that? Now, we do a show IP route EIGRP, you still notice that it's blind. But if we do a show IP route NHRP, look what happens. NHRP actually installs that 5.5.5 route, the destination, and it's installing it via the next hop of router 5, which it then installs the host route for your, your recursive lookup. So that's pretty cool. And we can do the same thing here with the, uh, the zero network. Bam. Same deal. First it traverses router 1. And now, bam, we got the shortcut done. So one of the things you can verify that that's actually working is if you do a show NHRP shortcut command, you can actually see the dynamic entries that was created for those specific uh, destinations, right? You can do a show IP NHRP as well, and you should see the dynamic registrations uh, going to the tunnels for the tunnel endpoints for router five, right? Perfect. So we got the static one, and then we got the dynamic, the three dynamics going um, to router five. And then same thing, show IP route NHRP. Because we had that two-way communication, router three already, uh, it did its process with the resolution and inserted its, uh, its IP address inside of the uh, routing table. But back at the underlying routing, you know, still, we are completely, uh, 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 the, the server provider is completely unaware of what's going on and what we're doing. You know, and if we throw IPsec on there and the, and, and the, if the provider is doing some kind of a packet sniffing or anything like that, they won't be able to grab your encrypted packets. Um, so that's just a uh, quick overview of phase three. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool, man. You know, so IP route. And you can get into some really cool traffic engineering once you start, you know, if you start working on different tunnel, uh, running multiple tunnels to destinations or whatever the case is. Or, you know, um, you, you might get into scenarios like it, with protocol design. Uh, that's one of the things I, I, I didn't want to talk about in the first video that I kind of forgot to. But as far as recommended protocols to use over with the overlay network, which is the protocol used for the DMVPN communication, Cisco, of course, they recommend EIGRP um, because of the distance vector nature. Um, they recommend actually EIGRP, uh, even RIP, um, before OSPF or ISIS. And the reason being is because OSPF has the, um, has the area dependencies. Uh, when you're creating, if you have multiple uh, tunnels and multiple DMVPN domains, and you're trying to bridge them together, um, you're gonna have issues with, uh, with link state advertisements and um, as well as flooding issues because you know say that you're in the service provider network and you start having flapping links in one of your DMVPN clouds well every router in that network will gonna it's gonna have to recalculate SPF over and over again until it becomes stable which can cause some uh, some some undesired effects with your uh, your, your your data plane um, for your forwarding traffic right um, and also the rules with summarization with OSPF, you already know uh, you can only summarize on the borders, either the area border router or the autonomous autonomous system um, border router. So in this design, say that you were implementing a phase three and you're using OSPF, uh, essentially you're gonna have to have some kind of a uh, 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 intra area setup to where either the tunnel network is area one and you have area zero uh, at router one. Um, and you can summarize there, but it's just it's not really as efficient because if you don't have where if you don't have your network set up in a in a a, a hierarchical fashion um, with your IP addressing, it could go to complete it completely to crap because you know it it it, it really de depends OSPF design really depends on contiguous networks. So um, any kind of discontinuous configuration within your core, it could cause some really bad routing issues. Um, 
So they also, they definitely rep uh, recommend using e RIP, or EIGRP or RIP. Um, also, BGP is a uh, uh, is a uh, as a preference. I prefer BGP, and the reason being is because of the fact that you have a lot more flexibility. Now, they always say you want to keep your two underlying um, and your your underlying uh, protocol different than your uh, overlay, um, which is the protocol, the underlying protocol that we're using for router one in this instance is eBGP going to the service provider. But say that we wanted to run BGP on top of the DMVP cloud as well, DMVPN cloud as well. The solution that I have, because what you can do is you can inadvertently um, advertise your MBMA addresses into the Tunnel IP network, thus calling, causing a recursive uh, failure, causing your tunnel uh, to crash. So you got to be careful of doing stuff like that. My solution for doing that is uh, I usually take advantage of BGP communities. So when I have routes coming, and I'll show you an example. So if I have routes coming from the service provider, essentially, I would actually have a route map set up for inbound and placing all routes received from the service provider and placing it into a uh, no advertised community. Um, you can do it either way. You can tell the service provider to do it. Typically, they won't. So you can put it on your own policy and say any any anything learned from the service provider market is no advertised. And so what that means is when you establish your BGP connection for the overlay network, um, those networks will never be advertised out to the rest of the spokes. So you, you, you won't potentially uh, black hole your uh, your DMVPN network. So uh, that's one of the uh, cool things, uh, you know, to, to, to keep in mind. And like I said, start reading through the documentation and play with the different protocols on top of this stuff because it, it, it does have their own, each has their own benefit. I think BGP is the most flexible. Um, BGP is the least complicated when it comes to having to do with filtering. With EIGRP or a RIP, uh, you got to deal with distribute list. Um, you know, depending on where you want to actually implement that filtering, it, it becomes a little bit uh, uh, of a process to actually do that configuration. With BGP, it's a little bit more flexible because you have tools like communities and and different things like that um, that can keep it from actually uh, advertising out. So. But that was my uh, quick overview for DMVPN phases one, two, and three. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, I may be doing another one where uh, I saw, I read a really cool design document that Cisco provided that uh, if you're familiar with MPBGP, like I explained before, it's when the uh, service provider, it multi-protocol BGP, you're able to have multiple uh, routing sources dump into BGP and essentially between your PE devices you have the MPBGP sessions exchanging those routes using the VPN v4 NL NLRI tags as well as the MPLS tags for transport well I figured well they said that you know you can actually configure that style of network using DMVPN as the access um, medium for that so you can create an MPLS tunnel uh, create your GRE tunnel enable MPLS on top of it and then you can run your uh, your B MPBGP sessions between your hub and your spokes and that way, if you have private customers hanging off a of router five, those routes would be exchanged through the DMVPN uh, MPLS enabled interface, right? Uh, through the BGP update, it's gonna pass it to the next spoke, right? Or the next hub, or the spoke in that case. And at that point, um, or actually it would go to the hub and you would configure the hub as a route reflector client. That would then reflect those routes back to router three. And then do the VPN v4 uh, MRI L and LRI lookups, it, it'll have the routes for those private destinations. So that's something that I'm probably going to end up doing. It's a little bit advanced, but you know, I, you know, once you start getting into this stuff, your mind starts wondering, you start thinking, what if I can do this, or what if I try this, or what if I do this? So, you know, this is one of those things that I encourage definitely read. Once you understand the technology, that's number one, don't get into the configuration until you completely understand what you're doing. And once you understand that, you know, start playing around and start running on scenarios and post your labs and, and, and show me your examples because I would like to see what you guys do. You know, this is a learning experience for everybody. So you can't know everything. So let's all share it and uh, I'll be looking forward to it. All right. Later.